Good day, dear listeners. Steve Preda here with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And today's guest is Pramod Raheja, CEO and co-founder on, of Agility, a leading designer and manufacturer of autonomous unmanned aerial systems or UASs. Their flagship product, the Minotaur, is capable of precision hover and high speed forward flight and can fly anywhere, including dirty and dangerous environments. Pramod has been captaining passenger flights with United Airlines for 25 years while building and exiting multiple businesses. Pramod, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Appreciate, appreciate it. Well, it's very intriguing to have an airline pilot who is also a serial entrepreneur. I never knew such a thing existed. How did yeah. you get here? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a thing necessarily. I think it's a bit of an anomaly. Um, uh -huh. There's there's plenty of airline pilots that have you know some side gigs or hustles and uh, or real estate, but I don't know only but a very few that I could count on my hand, maybe one or two others that sort of treat the entrepreneur, uh, their entrepreneur side as their primary side and, and not the other way around. So absolutely, it's an anomaly. So how does that even work? I mean, an entrepreneur often has to uh, struggle with, uh, you know, with urgent matters and, you know, burn the midnight oil. And uh, how, how can you then hop on a plane and uh, fly across the world? It, it's it's uh, difficult for me to imagine how. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that it, it really boils down to um, how you lead and manage. Um, so all those things that you described still happen and, and they have to be managed. And um, certainly there's a lot of juggling involved for sure. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. So I've been able to figure out how to juggle it really well. Um, but I think it also boils down to how you, uh, you know, how you, how you manage things in your company and, and how you delegate. And, and I, I think we're going to get into that a little bit today. So uh, I'll, I'll save that part of it. <laughs> okay. So, so tell me a little bit about, but first of all, how did you get here uh, to, to run this company? Um, uh, agility and, and to, to build it. Um, what is your story? And then we can get into more of the how of things. <clears throat> sure. So, um, I, you know, I would say that, you know, this, the way that we started this company was very much the best analogy I could give you is, is an arranged marriage. So, um, uh, so we, we spun our company, our initial intellectual property out of the University of Maryland. And the way that that happened is my co-founder and partner was developing uh, technology and some IP, um, nothing that had been commercialized, but he had aspirations to commercialize. And so um, I was introduced through the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Maryland at that time, Glenn Hellman, who, who introduced me to Evandro. And we, uh, we got to know each other. And after a few months, decided to start a company together. And even at that time, uh, you know, it was still in the very early days of unmanned systems, which was four, four and a half years ago. And um, we really didn't know exactly what the landscape looked like and what the business model should be, nor did we have any working technology. But we had a lot of faith in each other and that we knew that we were going to uh, make, a, you know, make something of it. And uh, here we are four and a half years later with some very cutting edge technology that is really at the forefront of what, what's possible. Yeah, so definitely I have some questions about that. But you also had another business, uh, according to LinkedIn, beforehand which was more of a franchise you were a franchisee yeah. or some kind of office services and you successfully de developed multiple locations so how, how did that come about yeah th thank you um so that was a company that you know that uh it's called intelligent office and it is a franchise based in uh, boulder colorado and many many years ago this is probably now we're going back i'm dating myself back to uh 2003 time frame um, and I have always, even though I wanted to be a pilot right out of, you know, right from a young age, I also was very, very interested in businesses and starting businesses. And even though that's not what I studied in school, I studied engineering in school. I just had this sort of knack and desire to want to sell things and, and, and make things. And so, um, going back, back in those days, we used to read the physical newspaper. Many of our listeners may not 
use look at physical newspapers as much anymore. And every single week there was a section on franchising in the Wall Street Journal and the USA Today. And I used to look at these businesses kind of with curiosity. And I used to say to myself, wow, I would never do that. Or that looks interesting. Or God, I, I don't want to do food or retail. That just seems too, uh, margins seem too low and et cetera. And then I saw an ad for this company called Intelligent Office. Um, and um, I, uh, I was really intrigued by it, showed it to my wife. Uh, she thought it was kind of interesting. She was very interested in checking it out. And so we, we went to something called a discovery day in, in, in uh, 2003. Um, and in early 2004, uh, we signed a franchise agreement and started the first location in Reston, Virginia. Um, and um, it was, uh, I thought that at the time it was, you know, a great um, business from a lifestyle perspective for being an airline pilot. Um, and, you know, I think that proved to be true. Yet, like you said, there's lots of blood, sweat, and tears. So none of that, of course, all of that happened. Um, but we did launch four successful locations in the DMV in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, and, uh, you know, really enjoyed that. That I think gave me a lot of legs and a lot of learning and a lot of know-how and a network that got built out of that to be able to do other things as well, because all those things are required ingredients if you're going to be successful in business. And I, I think that gave me a really good basis. Awesome. So, okay. So you have at least a couple of businesses and, and I know you had other things, but uh, the two substantive businesses, one is a fast growth kind of startup type, and then you had this franchise, it's a really interesting mix of experience. So as you, uh, you know, grew uh, alongside these businesses, did you pick up uh, some kind of framework or management blueprint that helped you build uh, one or both businesses? Absolutely. And over the years, I'm, I would call myself kind of a, a learning junkie. I love marketing, sales, all that. I love, I kind of become a geek. And one of the places where I've become a geek is uh, management frameworks, which is, you know, how do you actually, you know, do something efficiently, successfully, effectively. Um, and then when you get to a point of being able to scale, then how do you do that as well without the wheels coming off the bus or the train? And, um, and so um, in, in, I'll speak to the current company of Agility. We looked at a number of things. We looked at EOS and we looked at scaling up and, Really, we felt like we couldn't go wrong with any of any of those. Um, but uh, I was more familiar with the scaling up sort of methodology, and I, I definitely had some reservations around scaling up because it, whenever I would sort of study it or read the book, I felt like it was designed for a for a larger business and being sort of an early stage startup with a small team. Um, I wasn't so sure that it would be a good fit. Um, however, as we got into it and we started engaging uh, consultants and coaches. Um, you know, they, they were willing to modify it. And they said, hey, look, this is, you know, and here's some other examples of other startup companies that have modified it to make it effective for, for them. And so that's what we've done in their agility. We've, we've embraced the scaling up method and, um, and, and it's, it's, it's working. Um, you know, as we grow, we'll start to adopt and implement more of the methodology into the company as well. So, uh, so can you give, uh, give me a, an example or two about how you modified scaling up to and you know, what didn't work and how you modified it to make it work? Yeah. So, I mean, I'd say the modifications are more elimination of things, right? You, you see like a, a long list of laundry items that you could be doing and, and really just taking the most important things and focusing on those and also just reducing that list. Um, you know, I think when we, when I first went through one of the playbooks, there was like 25 items or something that seemed really onerous. And, you know, the answer was, Hey, you, you don't need to do all that right now. Uh, but we need to do certain things now. And, and so it was really just a strategic implementation was what it was of what, what made sense for our company. Mm -hmm. So what, what is your favorite tool in scaling up that you have used with success? Yeah, I think, you know, so there's, I mean, there's two that are probably, you know, across different types of system, whether it's EOS or whether it's scaling up, but in the scaling up system, they call it uh, the, the daily huddle, uh, which is really your leadership team. It, it could be the whole company as well, but um, we're a small team. So it, it's sort of one of the same for the most part, uh, but a, a daily huddle that really gets everybody on the same page. We know what each other's doing and, and can share information that either all of us need to know or some of us need to know. Um, and then probably, I, I said there was two, my favorite is really the weekly huddle because that's where we actually sit down and we actually get a little personal too. Um, and we've incorporated into that um, 
uh, a book club as well. So we, we have a book that we, that we read and we don't really have a timetable on it because of being a small, fast, very fast, fast growing and, and things are moving at light speed at, 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 at our, at the size of our company that sometimes we, you know, we have, we have to like forego a book club, but we try our best not to. Um, and so we, once a quarter or so, we're picking a new book basically it, 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 so far, historically, that's been the, sort of the timeline. That's pretty good. Um, so, so scaling up, you've been following scaling up and uh, you do the daily huddle, the weekly, is it huddle or weekly tactical meeting? Well, we, we, so again, this is where we did a modification. Uh, okay. It is a weekly huddle, but we do include into the, into the agenda also a technical meeting. Um, and we just recently, as our company has started to, you know, break out into more of a product company, Early, early, early days were very R and D focused, and so now that we're finally getting to what you know we, we would consider the holy grail of selling product, um, we've we have we've separated out a product meeting, so we have a separate product meeting every week, and and that's necessary just because there's so many moving parts there and so many things going on. But the weekly huddle still tends to be where we do have some you know we will we'll, we engineering discussion, and we use we use various software to to help us really organize and keep all that keep everything aligned. Okay. So uh, can you mention the software? Is it like a proprietary one or is it something that uh, is off the shelf? And yeah, I can, I can share what that is. Yeah, we, we, use, uh, we use something called monday.com um, and it's a collaboration tool. We use it across all areas of the company from HR to sales to uh, engineering and to product. Um, we've primarily, again, being an early stage company, we're really using it mostly for engineering. And now it's, you know, the product roadmap and all those things are also being stored, housed, developed, uh, uh, iterated on as well in there. And, and all same, same for CS, uh, sales. And then for my partner and I, we have a private dashboard for us to keep each other accountable and, and keeping track of what we're working on again, so that we we're in the know. <laughs> it's very easy to start, you know, start going in your own direction. And then the other person or people don't know exactly what you're doing and can lead to confusion and to misunderstanding. And so um, I think tools like this, especially in the world we live in right now, which is for us, very hybrid. It's a combination of being in the office and out of the office. And as we know from the past few years, the out of the office has, has increased quite a bit. And so having some of these tools, while you can't entirely depend on them, you still need to get on the phone, you need to get on Zoom and you need to talk to each other. Uh, they really help with just getting on the same page. So when you do get on the phone or Zoom, you're already knowledgeable and, and can actually be more productive. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. So you do the daily huddle, the weekly huddle, you do have a score, um, a dashboard, you call it? Correct. Um, is this a big, weekly dashboard? Are you looking well, at weekly metrics or monthly? Yeah, metrics? we actually have several, we actually have several dashboards. Um, uh, we, we, you know, we have like many companies, we have a software stack that, uh, you know, back in the old days, you had everything in the office, right? Now you have everything kind of in the cloud. So we have a stack and one of them we use is Align, which is, um, um, uh, I think it's align.com. Um, it's from a company called Petra. And um, we, we use that more from the leadership slash goals, quarterly and annual goals perspective. And then as you get more tactical and granular, that's when we go to Monday, you know, and, and that's where we have, you know, okay, this is what's happening on the engineering side, on the software side, on the hardware mm -hmm. side um, and, and, and supply chain, uh, you know, et cetera, that, you know, that, like I said, there's a lot of moving parts. So you have all these different things that are there and you can connect those things together as needed. Um, so there's a, there's a few different dashboards. So when we do a weekly huddle, for example, there are typically, you know, um, two to three dashboards uh, at every meeting that are, that are being shared throughout that meeting. Uh, one from, we start with the high level and then we kind of go down from there. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So you use the uh... Uh, align.com which is also i think a scaling up related product I think yes exactly as well that's correct and then monday.com is more about the product development uh, information that you have it's is it about engineering and manufacturing yeah, it's more about um all the different um pillars in your company so hr you know interview process storing mm -hmm. resume candidates what, whatever whatever you want it to be it's a very easy tool um it is quite um broad so it can get you know, cumbersome. So, you know, we just try to keep it as simple as possible and mm -hmm. um, it integrates with just about any kind of software you can think of. Um, in some cases, very good. In some cases, not so good. So um, we, we try to keep it as simple as possible and really stay focused on what's important. 
Um, you know, and for us, what's important really is execution. And so really that's what it's there for. It's a tactical execution tool for the most part, uh, where okay. a line is more the broader strokes of, okay, this quarter we were going to do these things. And did we, you know, are we on track? What, you know, where are we with these things as the quarter goes on? Yeah, priorities, rocks and goals and stuff like that. Correct. Okay, uh, very interesting. So uh, switching gears, uh, talking about your, your company Agility and the unmanned aerial systems market. So tell, tell me a little bit about this market. How, I mean, what are the segments in this market? What types of players are there? What does it look like? Yeah, so the unmanned aerial systems market is, is still a very burgeoning and early stage market. We're still very much in the early innings. Although you, most of our audience listening today has probably heard or seen drones at some point or see them at the store. Um, most of what you've seen are on the consumer side. So on the industrial and uh, government side, there is uh, just, you know, millions of use cases. Um, and, you know, and I obviously say that, you know, metaphorically, but there's just so many, so many use cases uh, and, and still growing and still, and still things still being figured out. So as far as segments go, yeah, I mean, you've got everything from, uh, you know, your consumer delivery that you probably you know, that, that makes the news, you know, that a package is delivered uh, to medical supplies in remote areas of the world, which is, is just phenomenal to be able to deliver blood or medical supplies, things like that. Um, and then there's also the, the um, critical infrastructure side. That's where we tend to play um, in, that, in that world, as well as public safety. So if I, if I go, if I start with public safety, for example, we're talking about search and rescue and um, active shooter and surveillance and things like that, 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 that you can use unmanned systems for and are being used for that. On the critical infrastructure and the enterprise world, um, there's, there's a lot of infrastructure throughout the world from bridges to cell towers to power lines that have to be consistently monitored and inspected and evaluated for damage or in, in many different forms, whether it's uh, rust as an example, or wires that have come off the line and need to be repaired, things like that. These need to be inspected. And it's quite dangerous for people to get up on these big ladders and things like that, that, that are required today. So one of two things happens, either they don't inspect as often as they should, um, and or it takes a very long time with current methods. So in both cases, you're talking about safety, uh, and time, which both have a lot of ROI, uh, you know, associated with them. And so, so that's, that's the world we're playing in. Uh, but the, you know, the unmanned aerial systems are being used throughout the world and are start, you know, and, and again, as I mentioned, early innings, there's, there's still a long ways to go as to how they're going to be used, where they're going to be used. And, and even the technology is evolving very fast as well. So what I'm hearing is that there is the consumer delivery. So essentially delivering stuff, and then you have observing infrastructure, making sure everything is controlled. And then you have the safety, which is, you said, search and rescue and surveillance. Are these the three major areas or there's something else? Uh, you know, I would say that it's, it's almost too broad to define exact areas. But if we were to try to keep it as simple as possible for today's conversation, yeah, I would say delivery and logistics would be, you know, one category. Um, another category would be preventive and, um, uh, you know, preventative, which is now you're getting into the inspections and things like that. Um, and third is, uh, you know, broader of uh, like, you know, for in, in public safety. So the, for the common good, you know, how do we use technology, this type of technology for the common good? Um, examples could be the, you know, the one example that's probably the very recent um, that just happened last week were the tornadoes in Kentucky, right? And, and even just not that long ago in the summer was that building collapse in uh, Florida, right? Mm -hmm. And so utilizing this type of tech unmanned systems to be able to go in and assess damage. And, and when you're assessing damage, you're assessing it from a, several different angles. You're assessing it from an insurance angle. You're assessing it from a safety angle to see if, or maybe there's still people that are, that are alive and, and, and could be rescued. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a number of angles as you come in with these technologies right at, in the aftermath of, of mm -hmm. that. And you can do it faster than if you have people on the ground walking through all this rubble, which again, may or might, may not be able to do. So if you've got a bird's eye view above it all, um, you have a higher likelihood of, of, uh, of getting insights and more positive outcomes that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So what are the trends? Uh, where is this technology growing? What, what are the, some of the new things that you observe happening as it evolves? 
Yeah, I think the most, the most, uh, the most in interesting and where we, we are actually our, our focus and our, our, where we are leading the way in many ways is on the artificial intelligence and autonomy uh, piece of it. So what do I mean by that? Um, so I'll start with autonomy. Autonomy means um, I am, you know, my, my system can do things and it can make some decisions when it needs to make decisions um, if it gets to a fork in the road as, a, you know, as, an, as an analogy. Um, which is different from automation. Automation is a task that just is repetitive and, and it's kind of being done automatically. There's not much of a brain there. Um, and, and then so you separate that into an autonomous system, which now says, okay, I'm flying through a door and I need to go left or right. And I'm going to, I'm going to use some sort of decision-making process to decide which way I'm going to go. Um, maybe I'm using a sensor that tells me that if it's in a search and rescue situation that somebody's alive to my left, I'm going to go there first. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then even having the, t the ability to say, okay, I'm running low on power. I, the drone, <laughs> running low on power. I need to do something about that. Maybe I need to land. Maybe I need to go back to base. Maybe mm -hmm. I was commanded to just continue the mission and just land once, I'm, you know, once I've gotten to that point. So you know, again, there's, some there's a decision tree that's happening there. On the artificial intelligence side is sort of what I just started to allude to. You have a sensor that is telling you something. And there's an algorithm now tied to that sensor that says, okay, I sense something. And now I'm going to make a decision based on what I sense. And that's where the brain or the artificial intelligence comes in uh, into play. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, going back to that same example, I think there's a human or some human, maybe I've sent something over there using infrared or some other form of sensors. And I'm going to go in that direction as opposed to going in the other direction. So, uh, so that's the kind of the AI, the technology of uh, decisions, uh, you know, using artificial intelligence. So that's one direction. You also mentioned that your new product is very accurate hovering and kind of fast forward speed. So what's happening on the physical uh, attributes of these uh, drones? How are they becoming better? What does it mean accurate uh, hovering? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so there's a lot that goes into that, actually. Um, and, that, and that is how our platforms are different and how we differentiate. Um, we have full patents on our platforms and they, we have full patents because they are quite different. Um, so everything we do is what we call vertical takeoff and landing and hybrid. So VTOL hybrid for short. Um, and, and that means exactly what you just described. It has the ability to hover and, 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 and do things in place. And then it also has the ability to go somewhere from point A to point B relatively fast using uh, the characteristics of like say a fixed wing aircraft that, that we're all used to and accustomed to flying on uh, long distances. Um, and we do that by articulating our, our, our thrust vectoring. So we have our, our, our engines that are mounted on pods that are attached to the body and those pods rotate. So as they rotate in a forward direction, uh, it gives the ability to now fly uh, you know, faster in forward flight. The body mm -hmm. itself is designed as a lifting body, meaning that it has some very meaningful aerodynamic characteristics that allow it to be very efficient. Um, and so hence, also, we can fly faster and further given those characteristics. Um, and so that combination of hovering. And then when you asked about the hovering, now the hovering has to do a lot more with the sensors and the algorithms on board to say, okay, mm -hmm. you can stay in place. And so you have sensors on board. We use a combination of lasers and optics in general to give us our positioning, our speed, our velocity. So we don't depend, and this is now an important point, we don't depend on GPS to do that. We have everything we need on board the aircraft. Do we use GPS? Can we use GPS? Yes. Should, should we use GPS in, in certain situations? Absolutely. But it's not required. And, and that's important because GPS is not a perfect system. You have to have line of sight to four satellites. And if you go under a building or in, under a bridge or in, inside a building, you just you will have none of that. And so you still need to be able to fly. So most drones today have a single point of failure, meaning if they lose GPS, they essentially fall out of the sky. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't do that. We are able to fly without that, without that, that one single point of failure. So we have redundancy mm -hmm. built into it. Okay. So, so uh, what I'm imagining is you've got this drone and you send it to a mission to do something and maybe it's inside a building, there's no GPS. So you basically, you program uh, the whole trip uh, in that drone and then they make autonomous decisions depending on some variables or what does it look like? A little bit of all that. So you can, you can, you can say, I want you to go from point A to point B to point C, and you can literally draw that out on our tablet. 
However, this is where now the artificial intelligence also comes into a play, or, or as some people would call it, a neural network. As you put that drone in that environment, you could say, I just want you to go over there, and I don't, you don't, I don't know how you're going to get there. Just figure it out. And the drone can figure it out. It can figure out openings and doors and say, okay, I need to go through here. And it'll keep trying to do that unless, unless there's some other logic that's been built into it. Like keep trying until you hit, you know, 50% of battery life for 55% and then return home. And mm -hmm. then we'll kind of take a look and reassess, you know, as an example, um, which is no different than a human. If you sent a human in to say, go, go figure out where to go. And they tried and tried. And at some point they ran out of, you know, uh, provisions. <laughs> <laughs> they said, okay, I've got to come back and try again. Um, it's, it's not any different than, than, than doing it that way. But you're doing it now in a way that if you're going to an environment that is the unknown, you can send in a machine versus the man. Um, and, and in some cases, that, that becomes important, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so how are we as uh, citizens protected from all of that stuff? So, if, I mean, should I be concerned about... Uh, you know, government, maybe it's the US government, maybe another government uh, tried to misuse that. Are there protections that uh, that defend us? I mean, my, my wife is concerned concerned all the time that someone is looking through the window and I thought her, listen, if there's a drone coming, they're gonna see everything. So how do we, uh, how do we not have to worry about this kind of stuff? So uh, I won't speak for other governments, uh, but the US government uh, has some very strict rules and privacy rules and so, uh, this is an ongoing debate, the question you're asking. I'm certainly not an expert, but I will tell you that there are very specific rules in place that, dis, you know, that, that disallow um, law enforcement or otherwise to utilize drones for that sort of surveillance that you're describing. Typically, if, if they're using a drone in a surveillance situation, it's a situation that they've already you know, they've already gone through all the motions of whatever they have to go through search warrants, or there's already an active shooter or what have you. They've already, they've already done that. And they've already been able to, you know, pass those guidelines and, and, and be able to use the unmanned system, aerial system in that environment. But you're, you're not going to see drones just flying around over your neighborhood just to, at least not in the U S for in the foreseeable future, just to be able to keep an eye on you like big brother. Um, you know, if there's a big public gathering, the Boston Marathon, things like that, well, it's within certain the city's rights to, to you know, keep an eye on those kind of things. And, and so they are utilizing drones and unmanned systems for, for those types of events. But those are, those are one-offs and, you know, not necessarily the daily, the daily rule. Okay. So, uh, so Agility is, re I mean, you said it was a manufacturing company and you are developing these drones. So what are a gross, what are the gross drivers for a firm manufacturing uh, these these drones? What what are you looking at? Yeah, so that's a great question. In our case, it's 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 a couple which I'll go into, and there's it's also evolving uh, as well. That because the the market is still relatively early and business models haven't quite been completely you know vetted out yet. Business models are still evolving. Uh, that is a changing target. But for right now, the the the, uh, the metrics for us uh, as we get into selling this product and, and which we have started to this quarter are really around uh, number of units sold um, and, it, you know, very simple, simple metric. Uh, but aside from that, um, we're developing software that is hardware agnostic, meaning that I can, we can put that software, that AI or that autonomous system software into any drone. So that, that will become a metric as well. Um, you know, how do we, how do we implement that? What does that look like? Um, you know, there certainly will be a, 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 um, a hardware cost to that. There will also be probably some professional services associated with that because of the implementation involved. So, um, so I, would, I would say that these growth drivers are evolving and changing. Uh, at the moment though, it's really, um, it's, about the, it's about the units sold, but it's also uh, government contracts. So um, one of the things I may have mentioned earlier in the podcast was that early on, we were doing a lot of R&D type of work in the first few years. Mm -hmm. and so, but most of this work was done off of paid revenue contracts. So we continue to evolve. And um, one of our metrics this year is, into, is to get into a phase two or phase three um, program with the government, which now really gets into a much further phase. Um, and so several different metrics that we're targeting uh, for the, you know, as we get into 2022 for, and, you know, units sold being one of them, a big one. And the main markets for you is the government? 
Well, uh, it is both. So we're we're a dual use company. So we sell both the commercial sector and the government sector. Um, I remember many years ago that was not the norm. Most of the time, you were either a government contractor or you were a, you sold to commercial. It's actually uh, the the landscape has changed quite a bit. Um, typically, um, if you're selling into the commercial enterprise, the government likes that and they see much more promise. The risk is kind of reduced for them. Um, and likewise, if you're selling in the commercial sector and you say, hey, I, I am selling into the government, like the Air Force or whoever, um, that gives you a lot of validation to say, okay, if they trust you, maybe I can too. <laughs> so, so we are dual use. We have our prongs in both places. I would say right now, as we approach the end of 2021, we're very focused on enterprise. Um, we're, we're, we're very close to landing some of, uh, or very early stage big customers. And so there's a lot of effort going into that as we round out the, the, the this year. So how do you sustain uh, you know, keeping your job as an airline pilot on the side of your, uh, your uh, enterprise? Is there gonna be a tipping point where you would say, okay, I'm going to uh, just focus on one thing because uh, I cannot spread myself uh, anymore. Right. So, you know, I think uh, I'll, I'll start with, I've been able to, and I've figured out how to manage the two that does come at the expense of other things. Right. I, I really don't do things like mow my lawn or, you know, even around the house, my wife fixes everything. So I, I'd say that there's, there's definitely sacrifices that come with that. I also will fly on weekends versus weekdays. Um, mm -hmm. So, so for, for the foreseeable future, I don't see that tipping point. I have, that's a, that's a, that's a great question because it's a thought that has entered my mind many times over the years. Um, and every time it's kind of entered it, I've sort of, sort of said to myself, I really like having this diversity in my life and I enjoy doing both. And um, even though I've been flying for all together 34 years, I still enjoy it very immensely. Uh, but I also enjoy, you know, the, the entrepreneurial side of things that, that, that are really a roller coaster at many times and, and day to day can be up and down. Um, so, uh, but, you know, the other side of it is I work primarily pretty much all the time. <laughs> So no matter where I am, and that's the beauty of, I think, you know, being in 2021, we can work from anywhere. Um, so, so the answer is no, I don't, I haven't seen that tipping point yet, but it certainly, you know, could be there and, and we'll have to address it when it, when it, when it, at that time. Okay. Well, um, I wish you uh, success with that. Obviously it's been working and it's nice to have a, a stable uh, paycheck when you're an entrepreneur. A lot of us would like to have that on the side. So if someone would like to learn more about uh, your company, Agility, and the products, uh, your drones that you are developing, or would like to personally contact you, where can they go? Absolutely. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. My, uh, my uh, handle is the same. My first dot last name, Pramod Raheja. My email is promote at agility.co, not com, but co. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, I'm fairly easy to find online. Okay. Well, Pramod Raheja, uh, thanks for coming on the show and sharing your, your story and your, your tools and, and uh, some intricacies of the drone business. Um, and uh, to those of us who've been listening, if you enjoy it, please don't forget to rate and review us, subscribe on YouTube, and stay tuned because next week we'll have another exciting entrepreneur coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.